Hello and uh, welcome to my classroom for this um, round of reading. Uh, we're going to read from 91 to 101 today. Um, sorry, I was like tripping all over my words last time. I was just really tired when I was reading last. So hopefully I can um, not do that so much now that it's a little later in the day. Alrighty, so 91, starting with Grandma Smith's Big White House. Grandma Smith's Big White House had green shutters and was surrounded by eucalyptus trees. Inside were tall French doors and Persian carpets and a huge grand piano that would practically dance when Grandma played her honky-tonk music. Whenever we stayed with Grandma Smith, she brought me into her bedroom and sat me down at the vanity table, which was covered with little pastel-colored bottles of perfumes and powders. When I opened the bottles and sniffed them, she'd try to run her long metal comb through my hair, cursing out of the corner of her mouth because it was so tangled. Doesn't that goddamn lazy-ass mother of yours ever comb your hair? She once said. I explained that Mom believed children should be responsible for their own grooming. Grandma told me my hair was too long anyway. She put a bowl on my head, cut all the hair off beneath it, and told me I looked like a flapper. That was what Grandma used to be. But after she had her two children, Mom and her Uncle Jim, she became a teacher because she didn't trust anyone else to educate them. She taught in a one-room schoolhouse in a town called Yampy. Mom hated being the teacher's daughter. She also hated the way her mother constantly corrected her, both at home and at school. Grandma Smith had, long, or had strong opinions about the way things ought to be done, how to dress, how to talk, how to organize your time, how to cook and keep house, how to manage your finances. And she and Mom fought each other from the beginning. Mom felt that Grandma Smith nagged and badgered, setting rules and punishments for breaking the rules. It drove Mom crazy, and it was the reason she never set rules for us. But I love Grandma Smith. She was a tall, leathery, broad-shouldered woman with green eyes and a strong jaw. She told me I was her favorite grandchild, that and that when I was, and that I was going to grow up to be something special. I even liked all of her rules. I liked how she woke us every morning at dawn, shouting, "Rise and shine, everybody!" and insisted we wash our hands and comb our hair before even eating breakfast. She made us hot cream of wheat with real butter and then oversaw us while we cleared the table and washed the dishes. Afterward, she took us all to buy us all out to buy new clothes and we go to a movie like Mary Poppins. Now on the way to Phoenix, I stood up in the back of the car and leaned over the front seat between mom and dad. Are we going to stay with grandma? I asked. No, mom said. She looked out the window, not at anything in particular. Then she said, grandma's dead. What? I asked. I'd heard her, but I was so thrown that I felt like I hadn't. Mom repeated herself, still looking out the window. I glanced back at Lori and Brian, but they were sleeping. Dad was smoking, his eyes on the road. I couldn't believe I'd been sitting there thinking of Grandma Smith, looking forward to eating cream of wheat and having her comb my hair and cuss, and all along she'd been dead. I started hitting Mom on the shoulder hard and asking her why she hadn't told us. Finally, Dad held down my fist with his free hand, the other holding both his, the cigarette and the steering wheel, and said, that's enough, Mountain Goat. Mom seemed surprised that I was so upset. Why didn't you tell us? I asked. There didn't seem to be any point, she said. What happened? Grandma had only been in her 60s, and most, most people in her family lived until they were about 100. The doctor said she died of leukemia, but Mom thought it was radioactive poisoning. The government was always testing nuclear bombs in the desert near the ranch, Mom said. She and Jim used to go out with a Geiger counter and find rocks that ticked. They, they stored them in the basement and used some to make jewelry for Grandma. There's no reason to grieve, Mom said. We've all got to go someday, and Grandma had a life that was longer and fuller than most. She paused. And now we have a place to live. Mom explained that Grandma Smith had owned two houses, the one that she lived in with the green shutters and French doors, and an older house made of adobe in downtown Phoenix. Since Mom was the older of the two children, Grandma Smith had asked her which she wanted to inherit. The house with the green shutters was more valuable, but Mom had chosen the Adobe house. It was near Phoenix's business district, which made it a perfect place for a mom to start an art studio. She'd also inherited some money so she could give up teaching and buy all the art supplies she wanted. She'd been thinking that we should move to Phoenix ever since Grandma, Grandma died a few months back, but Dan had refused to leave Battle Mountain because he was so close to a breakthrough in his cyanide leaching business. And I was, Dad said. Mom gave a snort of a laugh. So the trouble you kids got into a bit with Billy Deal was actually a blessing in disguise, she said. My art career is going to flourish in Phoenix. I can just feel it. She turned around to look at me. We're off on another adventure, Jeanettekins. Isn't this wonderful? Mom's eyes were bright. I'm such an excitement addict. 
When we pulled up in front of the house on North 3rd Street, I could not believe we were actually going to live there. It was a mansion, practically, so big that Grandma Smith had two families living in it, both paying her rent. We had the entire place to ourselves. Mom said it had been built almost 100 years ago as a fort. The outside walls, covered with white stucco, were three feet thick. These would sure stop any Indian's arrows, I said to Brian. We kids ran through the house and counted 14 rooms, including the kitchens and bathrooms. They were filled with all the things Mom had inherited from Grandma Smith, a dark Spanish dining table with eight matching chairs, a hand-carved upright piano, piano, what a weird way to say that, sideboards with antique silver serving sets, and glass-fronted cabinets filled with Grandma's bone china, which Mom demonstrate, demonstrated was the finest quality by holding a plate up to the light and showing us the clear silhouette of her hand through it. The front yard had a palm tree and the backyard had orange trees that grew real oranges. We never lived in a house with trees. I particularly loved the palm tree, which made me think I had arrived at some kind of oasis. There were also hollyhocks and oleander bushes with pink and white flowers. Behind the yard was a shed as big as some of the houses we had lived in, and next to the shed was a parking space big enough for two cars. We were definitely moving up in the world. The people living on North Third Street were mostly Mexicans and Indians who had moved into the neighborhood after the whites left for the suburbs and divided the big old houses into apartments. There seemed to be a dozen people in each house, men drinking beers from paper bags, young mothers nursing babies, old ladies sunning themselves on the sagging weathered porches, and hordes of kids. Zip break. All the kids around North Third Street went to the Catholic school at St. Mary's Church about five blocks away. Mom, however, said nuns were killjoys who took all the fun out of religion. She wanted us to go to a public school called Emerson. Although we lived outside the district, Mom begged and cajoled the principal until he allowed us to enroll. We were not on the bus route, and it was a bit of a hike to school, but none of us minded the walk. Emerson was in a fancy neighborhood with streets canopied by eucalyptus leaves, and the school building looked like a Spanish hacienda with a red terracotta roof. It was surrounded by palm trees and banana trees, and when the bananas ripened, the students got all free bananas. The students all got free bananas at lunch. The playground at Everson was covered with lush green grass, watered by a sprinkler system, and it had more equipment than I'd ever seen: seesaw, swings, a merry-go-round, a jungle gym, tether balls, and a running track. Miss Shaw, the teacher in the third grade class I was assigned to, had steely gray hair and pointy rim glasses and a stern mouth. When I told her I'd read all the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, she raised her eyebrows skeptically. But after I read aloud from one of them, she moved me into a reading group for gifted teacher or for gifted children. Lori's and Brian's teachers also put them in gifted reading groups. Brian hated it because the other kids were older and he was the littlest guy in the class, but Lori and I were secretly thrilled to be called special. Instead of letting on that we felt that way, however, we made light of it. When we told mom and dad about our reading groups, we paused before the word gifted, clasped our hands beneath our chins, fluttering our eyelids, and pretending to look angelic. Don't you make a mockery of it, dad said. Of course you're special. Haven't I always told you that? Brian gave dad a sideways look. If we're so special, he said slowly, why don't you? His words petered out. What? Dad asked. What? Brian shook his head. Nothing, he said. Emerson had his very own nurse who gave the three of us ear and eye exams, our first ever. I aced the test. Eagle eyes and elephant ears, the nurse said, but Lori struggled trying to read the eye chart. The nurse declared her severely short-sighted and sent Mom a note saying she needed glasses. No serene, Mom said. She didn't approve of glasses. If you had weak eyes, Mom believed, they needed exercise to get strong. The way she saw it, glasses were like crutches. They prevented people with feeble eyes from learning to see the world on their own. She said people had been trying to get her to wear glasses for years and she had refused. But the nurse sent another note saying Lori couldn't attend Emerson unless she wore glasses and the school would pay for them. So mom gave in. When the glasses were ready, we all went to the optometrist. The glasses were so thick they made Lori's eyes look big and bugged out like fish eyes. She kept swiveling her head around, up and down. What's the matter? I asked. Instead of answering, Lori ran outside. I followed her. She was standing in the parking lot, gazing in awe at the trees, the houses, the office buildings behind them. You see that tree over there? She pointed at a sycamore about 100 feet away. I nodded. I can not only see that tree, I can see the individual leaves on it. She looked at me triumphantly. Can you see them? I nodded. She didn't seem to believe you, or to believe me. 
The individual leaves? I mean, not just the branches, but each little leaf? I nodded. Lori looked at me and then burst into tears. On the way home, she kept seeing for the first time all these things that most everyone else had stopped noticing because they'd seen them every day. She'd read street signs and billboards aloud. She pointed out starlings and perched, that were perched on the telephone wires. We went into a bank and she stared up the vaulted ceiling and described the oct octagonal patterns. At home, Lori insisted that I try on her glasses. They would blur my vision as much as they corrected hers, she said, so I'd be able to see things as she always had. I put on the glasses and the world dissolved into, a f into fuzzy, blotchy shapes. I took a few steps and banged my shin on the coffee table. Then I realized why Lori didn't like to go exploring as much as Brian and I did. She couldn't see. Lori wanted Mom to try the glasses too. Mom slipped them on, on and blinking looked around the room. She studied one of her paintings quietly and then handed the glasses back to Lori. Did you see any better? I asked. I wouldn't say better, Mom an answered. I'd say different. Maybe you should get a pair, Mom. I like the world just fine the way I see it, she said. But Lori loved seeing the world clearly. She started compulsively drawing and painting all the wondrous things she was discovering, like the way each tile curved on Emerson's roof, how each tile, each curved tile on Emerson's roof cast its own curved shadow on the tile below, and the way the setting sun painted the underbellies of the clouds pink, but left the pile, piled up tops purple. Not long after Lori got her glasses, she decided she wanted to be an artist like Mom. As soon as we'd, as we'd settled into the house, Mom threw herself into her art career. She erected a big white sign out in the front yard on which she carefully painted in black letters with gold outlines, R.M. Walls Art Studio. She turned the two front rooms of the house into a studio and gallery, and she used two bedrooms in the back of the warehouse for her collected works. An art supply store was just three blocks away on North First Street. And thanks to Mom's inheritance, we were, a we were able to make regular shopping expeditions to the store, bringing home rolls of canvas that Dad stretched and stapled onto wooden frames. We also brought back paint oil, or oil paints, watercolors, acrylics, gesso, a silk screening frame, India ink, paintbrushes, and pen nibs, charcoal pencils, pastels, fancy rag paper for pastel drawings, and even a wooden mannequin with movable joints whom we named Edward and who Mom said would pose for her when we kids were off at school. Mom decided that we should get, she could get down, Mom decided that before she could get down to any serious painting, she needed to compile a thorough art reference library. She bought dozens of big loose leaf binders and lots of packs of lined paper. Every subject was given its own binder. Dogs, cats, horses, farm animals, woodland animals, flowers, fruits and vegetables, rural landscapes, urban landscapes, men's faces, women's faces, men's bodies, women's bodies, hands and feet and bottoms and other miscellaneous body parts. We spent hours and hours going through old magazines looking for interesting pictures. We, when we spotted one we thought might be a word, worthy subject of a painting, we held it up to mom for approval. She studied it for a second and okayed it or nixed it. If the photo made the grade, we cut it out, glued it on a piece of lined paper, and reinforced the holes in the paper with adhesive O's so the page wouldn't tear out. Then we got to the, out the appropriate three-ringed three, three binder, added the new photograph, snapped the ring shut. In exchange for our help on her reference library, Mom gave us all art lessons. Mom was also hard at work on her writing. She bought several typewriters, manuals, and electrics, so she have backups should her favorite break down. She kept them in her studio. She never sold anything she wrote, but from time to time she received an encouraging rejection letter, which she thumbtacked to the wall. When we kids came home from school, she'd usually be in her art studio working. If it was quiet, she was painting or contemplating potential subjects. If the typewriter keys were clattering away, she was at work on one of her novels, poems, plays, short stories, or her illustrated collections of pithy sayings, one was, life is a bowl of cherries with a few nuts thrown in it, which she titled R.M. Walls's Philosophy of Life. Dad joined the local electrician's union. Phoenix was booming and he landed a job pretty quickly. He left the house in the morning wearing a yellow hard hat and big steel-toed boots, which I thought it made him look extra handsome. Because of the union, he was making, a st making steadier money than we'd ever seen. On his first payday, he came home and called us all into the living room. We kids had left our toys in the yard, he, he declared. No, sir, we didn't, I said. I think you did, he said. Go outside and take a look. 
We ran to the front door. Outside in the yard, parked in a row, were three brand new bicycles, a big one and two smaller ones, a blue boy's bike and a purple girl's bike. I thought at first that some other kids must have left them there. When Lori pointed out that Dad had obviously bought them for us, I didn't believe her. We had never had bicycles. We had learned to ride on other kids' bikes, and it had never occurred to me that one day I might actually own one myself, especially a new one. I turned around. Dad was standing in the doorway with his arms crossed and a sly grin on his face. Those bikes aren't for us, are they? I asked. Well, they're too damn small for your mother and me, he said. Lori and Brian had climbed on the bikes and were riding up and down the sidewalk. I stared at mine. It was shiny purple and had a white banana seat, wire baskets on the side, chrome handlebars that swept out like steer horns, and white plastic handles with purple and silver tassels. Dad knelt beside me. Like it? he asked. I nodded. You know, Mountain Good, I still feel bad about you making you leave your rock collection back in Battle Mountain, he said, but we had to travel light. I know, I said. It was more than one thing anyway. I'm not so sure, Dad said. Every damn thing in the, in the universe can be broken down into smaller things, even atoms, even protons. So theoretically speaking, I guess you had a winning case. A collection of things should be considered one thing. Unfortunately, theory doesn't always carry the day. We rode our bikes everywhere. Sometimes we attached playing cards to the forks with clothespins and they flapped against the spokes when the wheels turned. Now that Lori could see, she was our navigator. She got a city map from a gas station and plotted out our routes in advance. We'd pedal past the Westward Ho Hotel, down Central Avenue where square-faced Indian women sold beaded necklaces and moccasins on rainbow-colored syrups that they'd spread on the sidewalk. I think that might be Serape. I need to look that up when I'm done. We pedaled to the Woolworths, which was bigger than all the stores in Battle Mountain, put together and played tag in the aisles until the manager chased us out. We got Grandma Smith's old wooden tennis rackets and pedaled off to Phoenix University, where we tried to play tennis with the dead balls other people had left behind. We pedaled to the Civic Center, which had a library where the library, librarians recognized us because we went there so much. They'd help us find books we thought they thought we'd like, We'd fill up the, the wire baskets on our bicycles and pedal home right down the middle of the sidewalks as if we owned the place. Since mom and dad had all this money, we got our own telephone. We had never owned a telephone before. Whenever it rang, we kids all scrambled for it. Whoever got there first summoned up a super snooty English accent. Walls residents, the butler speaking, may I help you? While the rest of us cracked up. We also had a big record player and a wooden cabinet that had been grandma's. You could put a stack of records on it, and when one was finished playing, the needle arm automatically swung down and the next record dropped down with a happy slap. Mom and Dad loved music, especially rousing stuff that made you want to get up and dance, or at least sway your head or tap your foot. Also, I did just look up that word. It's sarapi for the, the like cloth that, that the Native American women would lay uh, out to sell their goods on the street. Sarapi. That's a fun word. Mom was always going to thrift stores, coming back with old albums of polka music, spirituals, German marching bands, Italian operas, and cattle roundup songs. She also bought boxes of used high heels that she called her dancing shoes. She'd slip on a pair of dancing shoes, put a stack of records on the phonograph, crank the volume way up. Dad danced with her if he was there, otherwise she'd dance alone, waltzing or jitterbugging or doing the Texas two-step from room to room, the house filled with the sounds of Mario Lanza, Mario Lanza or um, um Papa tubas or some mournful cowboys singing the streets of Laredo. Mom and Dad also bought an electric washing machine that we kept out on the patio. It was a white enamel tub on legs and we filled it with water from the garden hose. A big agitator twisted back and forth, making the entire machine dance around on the dirty or on the cement patio. I don't have my glasses on. I keep switching the lines. It had no cycles, so you waited longer, or you waited until the water got dirty, then put the clothes through the ringer, two rubber rolling pins rigged above the tub that were turned by a motor. To rinse the clothes, you'd repeat the process without soap, and let the, let, then let the water drain into the yard to help the grass, grass grow. Despite our wondrous appliances, life in Phoenix wasn't a total luxury. We had about a gazillion cockroaches, big and strong, strong things, with shiny wings. We had just a few at first, but since Mom was not exactly a compulsive cleaner, they multiplied. After a while, entire armies were scuttling across the floors and the walls and the kitchen counters. In Battle Mountain, we'd had lizards to eat the flies and cats to eat the lizards. 
We couldn't think of any animal that liked to eat roaches, so I suggested we buy bug spray like all our neighbors did, but mom was opposed to chemical war warfare. It was like with those shell no pest strips, she said. We'd end up poisoning ourselves too. Mom decided hand-to-hand -hand combat was the best tactic. We conducted roach massacres in the kitchen at night because that was when they came out in force. We armed ourselves with rolled up magazines or shoes. And even though I was only nine, I already wore size 10 shoes that Brian called roach killers and sneaked into the kitchen. Mom threw the light switch and we all kids started the assault. We, we kids all started the assault. You didn't even have to aim. We had so many roaches that if you hit any flat surface, you were sure to take out at least a few. The house also had termites. We discovered this a few months after we moved in when Lori's foot crashed through, through the spongy wood floor in the living room. After inspecting the house, Dad decided it was a termite infestation and it was so severe that nothing could be done about it. We'd have to coexist with the critters. So we walked around the hole in the living room floor. But the wood was chewed through everywhere. We kept stepping on soft spots in the floorboards, crashing through and creating new holes. Damned that this floor isn't starting to look like a piece of Swiss cheese, Dad said one day. He told me to fetch him his wire cutters, a hammer, and some roofing nails. He finished off the beer he was drinking, snipped the can with his wire cutters, hammered it flat, and nailed it over the hole. He needed more patches, he said, so we had to go out and buy another six-pack. After he polished off each beer, he used the can to repair one of the holes, and whenever a new hole appeared, he'd get out his hammer, down a beer, and do another patch job.